this is gonna be perfect. And like after the second week, man, it was just like, why? And like he's just like screaming all the time. They can't appease him in any way. Oh, man. <laughs> it's funny because we were like, yeah, we just watched a show the other night, and someone was sitting there like, no one, no one likes babies. And it's like it's kind of true. It's like these people are like, I've never known a person that said like, oh yeah, that like first year so well. But most people are just like, kind of sucks. But sixteen. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to wait and cover absences once Katie gets back, since we don't know who's missing officially. So I guess we'll start with a motion to approve the minutes from the October meeting. Can I get a motion? Second. second. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any citizens' comments? Any cards filled out? No. No. Okay. Do we have anyone in the audience who would like to speak? Okay. So maybe if it's okay with you, um, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, we can move on um, and just begin the idea of champion presentations. And then if it's okay mm -hmm. with you, could we break when? Everyone gets in, we'll have dinner and just continue with those. Does that work yep. for everyone? Just so we're not. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, Jerry, and you're going to talk about the training, but let me get you a microphone. Okay. Are they limiting the amount of ideas we have? Hold on to one. They're like limiting the amount of idea ideas we're going to have. I only got like four. <laughs> <laughs> you guys see help, Katie? Just could you get him set up for train depot? And He's good. Right, what I thought I would start with is just a little bit of a history of a couple of things, first of all. Uh, first of all would be uh, how, how the, uh, the project of the train depot got started to begin with. And that was with the Centennial Committee, which started meeting about five years ago with the idea of doing something for the uh, Arizona State Centennial, which took place in 2012. Um, at, uh, as we began, we began looking at a bunch of projects that we could do to uh, celebrate the centennial. We ended up with two that went through. One was the parade. Uh, the parade uh, is called the Tale of Two Cities. It happened, there have been two of them now. It happens in February. And that project now goes to the parade committee. And the second project 
was to restore the train depot, uh, which was down at, it's called the Litchfield Station uh, Depot. It was at the end of Litchfield Road, a little bit east of there, and uh, it got moved several years ago. That, uh, that project is actually the Centennial Committee as a group ends at the end of this year. We actually went over a year as we're trying to transition from one uh, organization to the other. Beginning next year, well actually because in October we got our official 503C process, we become the Goodyear Historic Litchfield Station Foundation. Right? And the purpose of that is to take the train depot that used to be at the end of uh, Litchfield Road and, uh, and, and restore it and build a park or some sort of an attraction around it. Now, historically the depot was at one time the way you would get into Goodyear, the way you would get into Goodyear right now on I-10. Uh, it was where most people came into the city at one time, and uh, can we go to the next one? And basically, you would come in, and uh, it was actually not just the way you got into Deep uh, Goodyear, but it was also a kind of a meeting place. People used to go down there, wait for the train to come in. It was the thing to do at one point. Okay, that depot then was relocated, and uh, go ahead. Right, and it was relocated and became a stable. And what happened after that is the uh, city of Goodyear uh, came, uh, acquired that depot, and it is now up on wheels, and it is uh, outside of the uh, water department, down behind the dog park. Okay, we've looked at several locations for uh, relocating that. A couple of the early locations got vetoed right away for different things. And uh, the idea between 503C is to take that depot, put it on the ground, restore it, try to make it look as original as possible, and um, again, use some sort of attraction around that. Now, one option that uh, the this park department has committed to, if that's the one that goes through, would be to locate it in the area where the dog park currently is. It would be kind of reorganizing, reconfiguring that whole area and uh, putting some sort of a, a train depot right around that at that point. Uh, that would be one option where you had a place to go picnic, you could do the train ride, and then the, the building itself could be used by different organizations for meetings. Uh, one of the organizations, I know the uh, Trace Rios Historic Foundation, I can't remember the name of them, was interested in doing some things there. But it could also be used to use different uh, presentations at different times. There's a couple of model train uh, clubs that have expressed interest in uh, doing something there. A couple of the ways that we raised money to this point, we did a couple of car shows. The last car show was modeled or combined with a uh, model train swap meet. And uh, we've pretty much stopped at that point. The last thing that the Centennial Committee will do this year, if you happen to go to the uh, home run for the holidays, you'll find us there selling hot chocolate. Okay, now that was one of the parks. The other idea was to maybe take this thing and combine it with some other attractions. If you were to put it in a site, go ahead. Uh, if you were to put it in a site where you had things like restaurants, uh, other shops, maybe the Performing Arts Center, uh, some sort of a convention center, and combine that whole thing. And what I've got is a picture of uh, somebody that's done that. This is actually in Poway, California. But if you combine that like they did there, then you could use that uh, train depot during the daytime with picnics and things, but also use it as part of an attraction to bring people into Goodyear. Now, the, the train I've got here can, uh, that's, I took that picture in Poway, but you can also find that same train on a website called Yesterland, US, uh, Yesterland.com. That used to be a Disney line, part of Thunder Mountain. And uh, if you go to Yesterland, be prepared to spend a lot of time because you can get lost there. But uh, I've been searching that a lot, looking for additional trains like that. Other than something you sit on and take a kitty ride, I've been kind of looking for the idea of something that you actually get in and ride around the park and then you could actually use it sort of like a trolley, that type of a combination. And uh, anyway, after talking with a couple of the other members of the 
uh, Centennial Committee, they said to go ahead and, and you know, offer that out there. Uh, as I said, there is a commitment to do a park around that if that's the way we decide to go. There is a lot of interest in people who, once we get it on the ground, we start restoring. Now that we've got the 503C, the funding should be able to come in a lot faster than what we have been able to pull it in in the past. We'll probably not be doing anything through the end of this year as the, the foundation, but uh, at that point, we're going to be looking for volunteers, uh, people that want to get down there with a hammer and nails and some paintbrushes and start putting this thing together and, uh, and even maybe building some tracks around it once we can figure out exactly what kind of train we're going to get. Um, as I said, you know, I like the idea of the entertainment district myself. I have enjoyed visiting the one in uh, a couple of them that I've seen already, and uh, they, they do tend to go real well. And I guess I'll just open it up for questions if anybody got anything on that. So any ideas for the plan or any cards or thoughts? Well, I've got one. I'm certainly going to take this information and move it to the Parks and Rec plan. Okay. I think the idea of a, a train depot park and the, that kind of thing at the focal point of the park is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the one there has a, a gazebo where they actually do uh, uh, concerts. And they have a, a restaurant there called the Hamburger Factory, and there's always a line there. <laughs> One of my kids' favorite parks to go to is in Scottsdale. It's the McCormick Steel right. Railroad oh, yeah. Train Park, and fortunately it's an hour away. Right. But that's the park they always, if we give them an option of where to go, they say, oh, we want to go to the train park. Dad, we want to go to the train park. And it's because of things like this, the depot. It's because of they have the trains that you can climb on and play on, but they've also intermingled it with the whole theme around it, including the little kitty rides. Right. As well as the model railroad trains that they, they've got the tracks inside the building that you can go check right. out. And um, I think that's a great idea as far as having it in the parks and rec plan a theme type of park if we have that ability. Yeah, I I would like to see it not just a duplicate of what's over there. Right. Um, but uh, I think I and a couple of other people would like to see it kind of step up one, which is the <laughs> idea of something you actually ride inside of. Uh, you know, I think that costs 35 cents. <laughs> yeah, to ride that particular train. And, and they built that depot. That, that depot was not there. And that's actually a steam, the, the water tower works, the whole thing. And uh, you can see where they uh, uh, have really impressed that. You can, it's Poway uh, Midland R uh, Railroad. You can actually go on their website. And they can tell a little bit about it. I happen to know when I lived over there, a couple of the guys that built this train out, and they were great guys to know. <laughs> are, are they looking at a place? I, I really like the idea of the, the connecting different nodes around the uh, town with uh, maybe the train and the depot. And that's a nice idea. One park maybe in the parking lot or the commercial area or mm -hmm. something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A restaurant area is really good in that you can have a bunch of theme restaurants. You obviously should have a Western Steakhouse there, but you could have an entertainment area built into it, and then the train could be from a parking area through that area at night and uh, offer something in addition to just walking around that area. Yeah, I like his idea about park to park, but I don't know if the city center we might be a good area as well, or. I don't know if you want to have a start a new park from it or put out an existing park or a planned park or I'm just curious about location. So that's really a question or a statement. <laughs> um, what, I was, what I was thinking, you know, Jerry, I like think I like your idea. Uh, think in terms of in the in the central part of Goodyear, there isn't any gathering spot that we have. Right. Uh, so a community-centric development seems to make a lot of sense to incorporate this concept with entertainment, restaurants, cultural activities, those types of th so people can come together, not just for the train, because once you go to the train, you've been to the train, but there's also kind of other things. Right. And then you can use the depot, as you said, for gathering, meetings, uh, entertainment, along with the other venues as well. So I, I agree with you. Right. I, I would really like to see it as part of a uh, 
um, you know, a, a performance arts center. I'd like to see both indoor and outdoor performing arts centers. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been a fan of that. I many years ago helped start an outdoor theater and and uh, would be interested in. I probably wouldn't. You wouldn't get me on stage again, but. <laughs> Um, I love the idea of that being a center point for uh, a variety of things, um, the park, shopping, cafe, um, you know, we've all been talking about a creative arts center mm. here, maybe that could be part of it, but also if you could extend the train tracks and maybe even take it into a commercial area and actually provide a service, you know, yeah. for transportation. You know, instead of just for a fun thing. I mean, it could be it could be fun, but imagine somebody saying, "This is our office park, mm -hmm. and we have a train that will take you to the parking lot." I mean, you yeah. could incorporate that in a big, huge loop. Right. Their their other train is a trolley that actually runs on the same track, and that was a little bit yeah. uh, one's a fun train. One's a yeah, that was a little bit more of a challenge because of the width of the track. That's an unusual width. It's not a narrow gauge. It's not a normal gauge. So they had to redistrict or reconfigure the trolley to go on those tracks. And uh, that was a great thing. I just have a quick question, and maybe you can um, answer that needs to be explained. But why was it moved from Litchfield, Trustee to the Litchfield Park? They built a highway there. There's a highway on Ontario yeah. as well. Yeah, you know, no, the highway, t the, the, the train was. No, no, I'm talking about like n not, not the way out. Oh, like no. why did, why did not on the original site? Oh, well, waiting for a location when, uh, you know, when it was a train depot, when they expanded 85, then they had to relocate the train depot. Okay, then uh, the guy that bought it used it as a stable and it was in his field, right? Then when he didn't want it, he offered it back, the city bought it, and they put it up on wheels. It's on wheels right now. Right. You just need to hitch it up. No, well, the, the biggest restriction is it can't go north of the freeway because it won't fit under the freeway. <laughs> but, <laughs> but some of the locations we looked at were, uh, you know, one of them was vetoed because it was part of the Superfund site and the city didn't want to own that property even though it was offered uh, just because of the liability of that. But uh, that this is where it's at right now was just seemed to be something that was the easiest thing to settle on. And, and at the time that that kind of settled on, the whole thing was, can we get it up and on the ground before the centennial? We didn't, obviously. And, and it's, you know, some, some time away from that. So uh, there's still options on that. But, uh, uh, you know, I think now that we're kind of looking at it fresh, the idea of, of building it as part of something else. This is, the, the train depot was actually one of, three what could be considered historic. Now, it could never make the historic register because it's not on its original site. The other two buildings are on Yuma Road. One of them is um, uh, Romans. And, you know, when I heard that uh, way back when, I thought, you know, maybe that's where the Centennial Committee should be meeting, but that didn't go over at all. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, at this time, thank you very much. That was very informative. I want to apologize to the committee for being kind of tardy. And at this point, I'd like to start the meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. And then we'll take about a 10 minute break and everyone can get a sandwich. But if you would, bring them back to the table so that we can continue the meeting since we're about 20 minutes in. Okay, so please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's take about a 10-minute break and everyone get a sandwich.
fingers in the water where they're talking about building or locating the baseball hall of fame museum. And it's always in the eastern part of the city. We never get anything. Did you mention, like, oh, did you the mention of two other cities? Yes. Before that, my question is, okay. Can't say anything else. <laughs> We've got the perfect location. We do indeed. Vacant retail space right in the ground floor. Yes. Yes. Go for it. Yeah. Um, talked about the the gentleman who, the gentleman who's in the um, article, is uh, the gentleman who makes the decision. He's on contract with the city as our consultant. For things. Cool. <laughs> step, step forward. I love it. Yes. Yeah. We're working on it. Not to worry. I'm a huge baseball fan. So. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I might need you if we uh, have to do something with that. So, okay, it's a deal. Jessica, where are you doing? Um, so you doing hot yoga? Yes. Where are you doing that at? Right here. <laughs> By where that used to that fresh news used to be? Yeah. yeah. Huh. It's, it's, um, Demonstrating the need for our management assistant are you disorganized tonight? Yeah, right. Are they like <laughs> five when they do it? No. Yeah. 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 I do the. Yeah. 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 I can grab some. That's a lot better than I think. <laughs> 
just from personally, <clears throat> you're always moving. Yes. I always mention it to um, somebody. You know, you talked about the area just south of the river. And I understand somebody's buying that now. Some sort of I'm not sure where it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody wants to grow some sort of development. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is now. I noticed they're putting the new <laughs> entrance into the uh, you know, north of the dog park. They're putting the new entrance in there. They're going to put a traffic light up there, too. What's all that construction back there? It's all good. Fire and training center. Fire and training center. I drove by yesterday and they're, well, they're doing it. Yeah. Now, they're they're building a new entrance yeah. uh, and uh, the whole thing now. If the committee will come to order, uh, please enjoy your dinner and I'll talk for a few minutes while you do that. Um, we have a list of uh, names of people who could not be at the meeting tonight. Uh, Phyllis Hartwick, George Quiniff, Dave Mariucci, Todd Tupper, Jose Kuzma, Eduardo Borquez, and Deb Robinson. Every one of them emailed Katie and explained why they couldn't be here. It's a combination of everything from sickness to their daughters playing uh, cheerleading in a state championship game. So <clears throat> I read through all of them, and I feel like they're all excused. So if I could hear a motion to excuse their absences. I'll move to excuse absences. Brandon, and a second. All in favor, say aye. aye. They are excused. Are there any comments on the minutes from the October 8th meeting? Did you already do this? Yeah, we did it. They did it. You did it? Good. It's been approved? Thank you. This is a time for citizens who would like to address the general plan. You did this? Excellent. Did we have any speaker cards? Brandon was all over Good job, Brandon. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do the introductions before any more ideas? Um, do you want me to do that? Yeah, yeah. if you would. Okay. So before we continue with the idea champions, um, what we'd like to do is introduce some of the sitting staff that's going to be here tonight for our panel. And uh, I'm not going to try and preempt Katie because I think you'll talk more about it. But um, many of you know Goodyear has done, has, has done a strategic plan. And part of the uh, strategic plan is this priority-based implementation process. And so when you do the general plan, it's one thing to say we want to do, we want to do, we want to do. But the other thing is, um, you know, now you have to do it. You know, they have a saying in the private sector, you got the work, but now you have to do it. And so these um, individuals are going to talk with us about uh, ways in which the city actually does it, actually implements these ideas. So um, with us tonight, we have um, three staff members. Uh, we have Kim Bradford, who is an executive management She's going to talk a little bit about the strategic plan. I handed that document out, plus a flyer, um, at the beginning of the meeting. So all of you should have that. And that's uh, this at your place, if you don't have that. And then a copy of this. If there's anyone in the audience that doesn't have it, let me know. Um, then we have Lynette Reed, who's the deputy city manager. And then she'll talk a little bit about what priority-based budgeting is. And this is really how plans like the strategic plan and the general plan and all the other kinds of master plans we have really get moved into action. And then we've got Bob Beckley, who's another deputy city manager. What he's going to talk about is how we fund it, really, like where the money, he's the money man. And so he'll talk about how these ideas that get moved into action also get funded and how that process works. And then after that, we'll just open it up um, for discussion and try and help you um, uh, talk through that. And I think the idea is, as Katie writes the implementation section, to begin to think about how we want to begin to recommend some of these ideas move forward. Um, so with a better understanding of the process, we'll be able to do that. So having said that, um, I think we'll continue now with the um, idea champions. And then the one
Correct. I believe we've touched on the topic of economic development a little bit in some prior meetings, talking about things like the airport, et cetera, things that are out there areas. But I don't think we've talked about how we go about it. Economic development is a component of the 2025 plan. It did not exist in the 2003 plan. It was not a requirement, et cetera. It's something that is yet to come, and I hope we uh, can find some time to talk about it. There are many topics you can address in economic development, but I wanted to get on record talking about one particular related element, and that's incentives. The function of city government is to, sim quite simply, is to provide services to the residents. The typical services you would find from a municipality, things that aren't provided by federal, state, or county. And also, to foster a good quality of life in the city, and some of that involves growth. But to do all these things, you need money. And the city's sources of revenue are very limited. You're talking about taxes, you're talking about fees, and that's about it. There has been an erosion in these sources, certainly over the 10-year period of the current plan. Some of that, of course, is due to economic issues. We all say no one could have foreseen what happened in 2008, and that's true. Some of them are due to legislation. If you don't know it, I have to tell you, the Arizona legislature is not city friendly. They have done or tried to, in recent months, change and restrict for instance, the economic development and impact fees that cities can charge for development that comes in, be it residential, commercial, or whatever. All of that limits further the city's capability to raise money. Now, I'm not here to debate the merits or relative lack of merits of economic development fees. I'll leave that to others, but times have changed. We must husband our resources, and the methods of support for economic development that, have done it, that we've done in the past need to change. There's a housing component in the previous plan, the current 2003-2013, and one of the objectives there is provide a diverse stock of housing projects, and one of the sub-policies there is, and I'm quoting this because I would think the same sort of discussion is going to need to happen in an economic development component of the plan we're working on. The city shall prepare an incentives plan that considers, but is not limited to, tax incentives, tax-exempt financing, and grant and aid support as a catalyst to partner with development, et cetera, et cetera. We can't carry this sort of thing forward. Now, it may sound like I'm anti-development or anti-developer, but that's not my point. Private development spends lots of money on creating developments at considerable risk. That's their business. The city is not a normal business. It is not a financial institution. Bottom line, I suggest that when we talk in economic development, for our plan that we suggest two simple guidelines for the city to operate under in terms of incentives. One, the city will not share tax revenue nor any other ongoing revenue source. We have to preserve a source of revenue to fund our government. 
We can't be giving half of it away to someone because they're going to build a store or a mall or 500 homes. The way it's been done in the area where the mall may yet indeed come. We can't give that away. We can give away land that we own. We can do things like we did for Dick's Sporting Goods and offer to pay for infrastructure. Sewer lines were put in that normally they would have had to put in and others who will go into that development. The city fronted that. I'm fine with that. What I'm not fine with is saying, you get half the TES tax revenue for a, for a district for an untold number of years. That's, that's suggestion one. And the, simple, the second simple guiding principle should be any incentives offered must only be based on actual achieved results. Too often we've given money up front. SunTech Properties is an example. We didn't give them money outright. There were incentives for them to, to have education programs and job training programs and et cetera. They left. I don't think they completed the term that they were supposed to. I have no idea what arrangements have been made. If they owe us anything based upon the agreement, and if so, we're going at them. My point is, businesses fail. If we give them an incentive in terms that has monetary value, we need to give it to them once something has been accomplished not based on a promise, and not based on an expectation. So that's the simple thing. Two guidances. Don't give away your core revenue. You don't share your paycheck with anybody, except maybe your church, synagogue, mosque, whatever, okay? Don't do it if we're a city. Secondly, if we're going to make a deal with somebody, don't make it predicated on promises make it predicated on actual results. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay so that, and first of all, remember cards, but are there any thoughts about these two ideas? One, don't giving away, not giving away your core revenue, and the other one is sort of uh, making businesses prove themselves uh, before we dedicate, am I right about this one? Before we Well, make, make the plan pay. say, we'll pay you at, at, the, end at the end when you do something, not say, We'll pay you now it's like sort of because you will do sense. something. Okay. Because <laughs> montage is gone. The people who built the cotton, were supposed to build the Cotton Red Bridge are gone. We all know the whole story of the ballpark and road. Those, you know, things happen. Don't give it to them. Okay, are there any thoughts about that or any questions? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I actually like the guidelines he came up with. I, unless anybody has an idea on a way to expand on that, I actually fully agree with everything he just said. So. If that's something that we can put in the plan, I think we should put that in the plan okay. and, change, and change what it is we saw in the whole So maybe plan. just recommend some guidelines for economic development? Uh, those are pretty much policies, so those are, you know. Yeah, I mean, I. We don't want to say yeah. you can do this, you can do that, you cannot. But, so I tried to be pretty, yeah. pretty no, general. I, uh, no, I agree. I think, you were, I think you were pretty general in that. I like the idea, so. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead. I'm gonna. I'll just work clockwise. I mean, for me, you know, I definitely get the point, and I agree with the core revenue aspect of it. But the, it's very competitive from city to city, municipality, whatever, and bringing some of these developments in. So I think whatever you would want to write, however you write it, you wouldn't want to hamstring your government too much, where now you're no longer able to compete. So with the other kinds of incentives that other cities might be able to offer these large employers. So okay. I, I agree with the concept, and I just would be concerned with how it's written so you don't reduce your ability to compete. Okay. So. Are you noting, do you want me to get you some cards? Go back to page four a little bit. You're I'm taking notes. Just okay. Because they're more generic, yes. so they're hard to put on cards. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, sorry. Um, I agree with Mark. I think he's got a really solid idea. But historically, is that what we're doing? I mean, I don't want to be naive to this, but historically we're giving away the you know, the store, and then if they fail, we, we're left with nothing? Well, basically, we have four deputy city managers. I mean, we're looking <laughs> at... <laughs> if, <that's them. laughs> if, if we were looking at the shopping center, okay, the new shopping center, 
what is it that we promise them besides the infrastructure? So uh, Kathleen, your, your question is right on. So we're reimbursing infrastructure that was put in around the mall on the, on the mall project. So um, until the infrastructure is paid off, 30% of revenue from the mall, the tax revenue will go to pay off the infrastructure that was put in around the mall, the ring roads, the bridges, intersections, et cetera. So um, to, your, yeah, to your point of have we been doing this traditionally? No, in fact, um, the state legislature uh, passed some laws in the last five years that require cities, municipalities to do an economic impact analysis on any incentive that demonstrates upfront that the project will return more revenue than that which is anticipated as um, participating in the project. And so um, the cities typically don't write checks upfront. Uh, for example, on the SunTech project, um, there was an element of it which was um, refunding to folks who bought a house in Goodyear a do per dollar amount for them to locate in the community. So if they hired Goodyear residents or bought a house in Goodyear, there was a dollar amount that was given. And the theory behind that is that the benefit then stays with the person who works in the community. So you're investing in your workforce. And that's a fairly traditional piece of economic development, a fairly traditional tool, where if the company leaves, the benefit to the community stays with the employee here in the community. Um, I was in business several years in my life, and I entered into a lot of contracts that had incentives. It never failed that if there were incentives to where I could actually profit or be ahead financially, there was also penalties if I didn't fulfill my part of the contract. Therefore, I mean, we don't want, like Brandon said, we don't want to run businesses or keep them from coming here because we don't offer incentives, but... There's, I never had a problem signing a contract that had a penalty that if it was a five-year contract and I moved out after three, I owed so much money back. And maybe that would be a, a good way to protect us and still not alienate future business that wants to move here. Just a suggestion. Chuck, those are traditionally termed as clawbacks in economic development circles, and so there's a clawback in almost every contract rewrite that requires either um, the incentive to stop should they stop performing on the contract or that they refund in the case of any you know upfront type uh, scenario. But um, by and large, we have about 80 development agreements in this community. The vast, vast majority are performance-based, meaning the project itself must generate the revenue to get any sort of reimbursement so it, it's very rare to see a city up front any type of revenue or dollars Thank you. And first, I have to apologize for my tardiness and the disorganization. Hopefully, I got it all out in one go <laughs> and we'll have smooth sailing from here on out. But now that I'm on this side of it, I can laugh. And I was telling a couple people, there's a pile of sandwiches in my back seat. That's how the end of Chuck's and my adventure went. So Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> so extra sandwiches for free in the Katie's car <laughs> after the meeting. Um, I want to thank our deputy city managers and um, Kim, our executive management assistant, for being here. Um, Wynette Reed, she's a deputy city manager, and she's over um, police and fire, human resources. Is that correct? Yes, and IT. Oops. Is that not on? IT, city clerk, and municipal courts. She was our um, human resources director mm -hmm. and then moved up into the deputy city manager role. Um, Bob is um, over public works. Um, public works, uh, parks and rec. Parks and recreation engineering. and engineering. Um, and you have a public works background, is that correct? That's yes. Correct. And then um, Kim is um, Brian Dalkey, our city manager's right-hand gal, <laughs> and does just about everything that needs to get done for the city. And I just want to, um, 
I'm really excited for them to be here to see this group in action because um, you guys are an impressive group. But I'm also, um, I just want to point out that um, we have a lot of great support from our city management. And I know Leslie is telling me all the time how amazing it is um, that this doesn't happen in other cities. You can't get deputy city managers to come to your general plan committee in other cities. You don't get people just trusting the planning and zoning division to just run with the general plan. and. Um, that's the leadership you see right here at this table. So I'm really excited to have them actually be a part of this process um, hands-on tonight. So um, I just want to make sure everyone realizes that, that this is um, just really a great show of their participation in this process and their support for everything that all of you are doing. Um, and we all really appreciate that. So what we're going to talk about is kind of, again, we're, we're now in the phase where we're talking about implementing the plan. And there's so many ways to implement the plan. You know, we're putting action items in the plan. We're, um, we have the zoning ordinance, um, policies and guidelines, our master plans. Tonight, we heard a presentation from Jerry, I mean, the Centennial Committee, that is implementing something that's going to make its way into the plan. Um, we create partnerships. We're looking for grants. But um, we want to kind of talk about this in a more organized way. So I think I've shown you this chart before, where the two major things that are coming out of the general plan are the land use and transportation plan and all, all the goals, objectives, and policies. And those kind of go into three major areas of how we implement. And last time we talked a little bit about the development process at the October meeting, those growth areas. You know, we use the zoning ordinance, how we review zoning and planning through the Planning and Zoning Commission and then the City Council as a way to implement all of those development policies that are in the land use and transportation plan. And then we have the master plans, um, which we're going to be talking about next month, which provide more detail on a specific topic like parks or transportation. We're going to get an update on those plans next month. But then we have this other part, the strategic plan and budget. And again, th this isn't always highlighted in other general plans. But because we have such a strong commitment to good planning in the city, we're able to highlight this area. And usually, a lot of what you do in your general plan is you put these action items in, do make it into your strategic plan, but not always. But um, so we have a really great opportunity tonight to learn about the strategic action plan, learn about our new budget, and learn about the CIP and the IIP and how we can all work together, how maybe there's something we can do to the general plan to strengthen and help out the strategic action plan or CIP process. And then, of course, they'll be wanting to hear from you on how we can um, make sure the general plan's getting incorporated into the processes that they're working on. So that's what we're talking about tonight. And so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Kim Bradford, who's going to talk about the strategic action plan. And wait, sorry. I should just mention that <laughs> <laughs> you do have a copy of their presentations in order with your um, agenda, so you can follow along. Yeah. Or I can just speak to it. All right, thank you so much uh, to Katie for inviting us. Um, as you can tell, I'm very anxious to speak to you about the strategic action plan, uh, which has really been, um, I guess, kind of a labor of love for so many at the city uh, to really kind of organize um, the things that we're working on over about a three-year period. So uh, please feel free to ask questions, and I know we'll have an opportunity to kind of dialogue at the end as, after we go through the process. Um, so as you can see here, we have um, a fiscal year 13 to 16 city strategic action plan. And uh, you'll notice that we have the word action in the title, a little bit different than your typical strategic plans, which are uh, a five-year look, kind of those uh, high-level goals. Um, our council really wanted to hone in on what is it that we as a council are prioritizing that you as staff are going to be working on that we will marry into our budget process to really move forward our vision for the city. Um, so back in 2011, the council and staff really worked on the uh, vision and mission for the city, which you have in your uh, executive summary there. Um, and then throughout 
all of 2012, we worked with the council, with all of the departments, to really focus in on the strategic priorities that you'll see in there and that we'll talk a little bit about that are the foundation for this plan and how are we going to develop goals around that and also bring forward strategic initiatives that all the departments will work on to support those four areas. We last year um, a, had a city council retreat in November of 2012 where we spent uh, half a day, a uh, very exciting half a day, going through every single one of the goals that's in the plan, all the various action items, and really had a very interactive dialogue with the city council, hearing what their ideas were, ideas from the departments, from their own plans to really focus in on uh, what we think we could move forward in a three-year period. We adopted the plan with the council in April and then also linked that into our budget process. So as we were talking about programs in the budget for the year that we're in right now, we linked them to the strategic focus areas. We linked them to the goals that were in the plan. And then also if we were asking for any additional funding, we, we communicated to the council and to the public of here's how what we're asking for directly supports what you have said is important. Um, we just did an update, a mid-year update to the council in October and also just revisited the plan with them at the retreat that they just held. Uh, boy, maybe it was just a week ago. It seems, uh, <laughs> seems like a long time ago. Um, so what you have in front of you is the executive summary. There is a very comprehensive document and in there I put it's on the city website uh, and feel free to, to go on the website and download it if you'd like. What you have is a summary of the vision, the mission, um, the strategic priorities which I'll, I'll describe in just a moment and then all the goals that are supporting those strategic focus areas, the action items that are within the document, and then our latest update as far as what we've accomplished since April when it was adopted and what we have coming forward. So this, this diagram that you see here uh, is probably one of the most exciting things, and I know you'll see it in Wynette's presentation also, but this really succinctly represents all our efforts to align the work that you're doing, the work that Katie has been doing, the work that the council has been talking about, all our departments, to make sure we're all moving forward in the same direction. Uh, as Katie mentioned, we have a very unique opportunity right now to take the work that you're doing in the general plan and what the citizens will ratify and our utilization of our strategic action plan really is that implementation piece. Um, Katie gave a presentation to the council and to the planning and zoning committee in October to talk about how the fundamental strategies and the general plan that you've developed so far really align with our strategic priorities which which you'll see here so on our visual representation you'll see the general plan is kind of that overarching long-term vision that we then take and look at our strategic action plan every year as we develop the budget and look at our resources which Wynette will will talk about and make sure that we are um, looking at the correlation the priorities and really focusing on implementing what some of those ideas are Now, I know you all can't read that on the screen. I uh, gave you a little handout of that. Uh, what this is, and I won't, I won't read it word for word, but it's basically the mission of the city. So it's kind of the, the core service of what are we here to do as a city. And then also our vision of what do we want this community to be. And one of the exciting things as, as I've been working on the strategic action plan, and Katie has also been working with this group, is we have really um, made a concerted effort to kind of stay in touch with as you develop the plan, how is that correlating to the strategic plan? And they are very, very uh, on point as far as what is the vision for Goodyear long term. Um, I brought one of, one of Katie's slides because she did a really good job kind of showing those fundamental strategies that are in the general plan. And even though the wording, the verbiage may be a little bit different between the two documents, the things that are a priority in both of those documents are the same. The parks, the connectivity of our neighborhoods, the healthy lifestyles, the arts and culture, trails, 
economically vital community that's sustainable and that's really providing an outstanding quality of life. And so you'll see that on your, on your poster there. The other piece that I'll talk about on this visual are those four strategic focus areas. So we have fiscal and resource management, which really focuses on how are we utilizing not only the, the money that comes into the city in forms of revenue, uh, but also our human resources. Are we conducting our business as efficiently as possible? Let's look at how we can do things better at a lower cost, maybe form some partnerships, um, and in order to make sure that both fiscally and human resource wise we are being as efficient as possible and transparent. Uh, and so that also ties into a lot of our budget practices. Then we have economic vitality, which is not only some of our long-term planning, so you'll see things in the plan that relate to the general plan effort and making sure that that moves forward according to the time schedule, our transportation master plan, our parks master plan, um, but also um, the economic development piece. What are those strategic efforts that we are looking for to build that sustainable revenue base for the city that really kind of allows us to do all the other items in the plan? We have sense of community, which is focused on, uh, you'll see some of the recreation um, opportunities for citizens. How are we uh, providing that sense of community? And then also our communications, making sure that um, the community is feeling like they have a voice with us and then are also um, reciprocally receiving information from us as far as what's going on around them, what are, where are opportunities for them to get involved. And then quality of life um, has such things as public safety, uh, transportation is also in quality of life, and then also um, youth development, clean, uh, sustainable community, code compliance, and making sure our community stays vibrant. This slide, uh, you'll see those four strategic focus areas in the middle, and this is just kind of a, a summary sheet where you can look at the different goals that just kind of touch on what I described right now as far as the different areas that are supporting those four strategic focus areas as we move them forward. And then just a little bit about the process. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, just did our first status update to the city council, and as part of that process at our council retreat, we brought forward some staff items that we were looking for uh, that would really kind of advance the vision for the city. Uh, and I want to stress that a little bit. When you look at the plan and the items that are in there, it's things that are above and beyond the normal, um, you know, we're going to make sure the streets are clean, the traffic signals are working, the water's tested. So that's our core activity. These are focused on things like how are we planning our infrastructure strategically that will grow our city? So how are we investing in developing our water resource plan? How are we planning our transportation corridors? So kind of those higher level items outside of the core day-to-day -day operations. Um, council also uh, is out there. They're in the community. They hear a lot of ideas. So as part of this dialogue, they also have the opportunity to bring ideas forward and talk among themselves as a policy body, how do we want to prioritize those things that we're moving forward? Certainly, um, as was talked about earlier, we only have a finite amount of resources, and so part of this process, as you'll see on the diagram, is we'll take those items and then evaluate, Can we? do we have the capacity to do those right now in the resources that we have, or is there something that needs to come forward in the budget process as part of a request? So that's an important piece of this process. Items that have the support from the council to move forward in the budget process are linked directly to those goals. And then once we have direction from the council to move those forward, they'll be incorporated into the plan and then updated. And then that's a, a continual process. We'll give a mid-year update, and then we continue to monitor our progress on those and then kind of repeat that process on an annual basis. So that's uh, kind of the high-level overview of the city strategic action plan, and uh, I'll let Wynette kind of talk to you about the budget piece of that. I'm one of those individuals that likes to have the controls here, so <laughs> we got it all set up. 
Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over a new initiative here at the city that uh, we've been working on, and that's called priority-based budgeting. And it's a way that we align how we allocate resources uh, to our priorities within the city. So um, like Kim mentioned, you're going to see this uh, graphic a lot. It is something that um, is really driving a lot of what we're doing here at the city under our performance management program. As Kim went over the counts, uh, the uh, general plan and the strategic action plan and how that all flows, that for me is really tells us a story as to what we do as a city. These are the things that we do as a city. But then how we do those come underneath that, and that's your department operating plans, your department strategic action plans, and your priority-based budgeting. That's how we deliver those services. And then finally at the bottom of that, and it's not you know, last but not least is the how well do we do those things. And that's where we get into the performance measure part of it and our feedback from our citizens and citizen surveys. So it's a continuous loop. We get the feedback from the citizens that forms a strategic action plan that tells us what to do. And then we figure out how we're going to do that. And that's where I'm going to spend the rest of this time on the priority-based budgeting piece on how we allocate resources going forward for us as a city. As I mentioned, this is a brand new process. We are learning this process as an as a organization and going through uh, setting this up. The idea is to make sure we're achieving long-term fiscal wellness. That's important, I think, to all of us. And we do that by making sure we allocate those resources, a finite amount of resources, to the priorities of the citizens and the council. So making sure that we're actually, it's not just who's arguing the loudest, but really looking at a, a, a way that we can align those resources with the priorities. So the steps in a priority-based budgeting process. And this is pretty high level. There's a, a, a lot behind this, but there are about five primary steps that we are going through. The first is to determine what results we want. That's what you're doing. That's what feeds into the strategic action plan. Those are the results we want. And so we have identified those in the strategic action plan right now, and I'll kind of get into uh, that a little bit more. The next is to clarify those results. What do they mean? When we say sense of community, what does that mean to a citizen? When we say quality of life, what does that look like? Because we should be able to define what that looks like in order to make sure we're achieving that result. Identify the programs and services that we offer as a city, and then we go through a process of costing those services out and scoring them to see how closely they support those results we're hoping to achieve. Again, I go back to the results that we're, <coughs> we're aligning that to the strategic action plan, which comes from the general plan. So we, we actually are going through a process right now where we have identified all the programs we offer within the city. Departments are costing those programs out. We're taking the fully loaded cost of what an employee cost us with salary and benefits. <coughs> we look at what the commodities might be what contractual um, fees we might have, we look at revenues, and we cost out those programs. So instead of looking at a line item that says, here's your office supply line items, we are looking at the program cost as a whole, which includes office supplies and personnel. Then the scoring piece of it is what we're actually in the process of doing right now, and that's how well do these programs support the overall results for the city. So we have a process that we're going through where we're scoring those to see how closely they support those results. And then the value of the programs based on the, the results is the scoring piece of it. And then we allocate resources based on those priorities. So what are the results? The results are these very high level reasons the organization exists in the eyes of the community. They're not the vision or the mission. They're not the organizational values, but they're the overarching reasons we exist. And so our results really right now go back to the strategic action plan. We exist to be for the fiscal resource management of the um, being good stewards of the citizens' money and managing our, our personnel, economic vitality, 
sense of community, and quality of life. We have also, because economic vitality and quality of life are really large areas, a lot of the initiatives that we are working on in those two areas, we kind of pulled out kind of two sub areas. And you'll see under economic vitality, we have, and my eyesight isn't that great, so it is effective mobility and reliable, well-maintained infrastructure, which is a subset of what is in economic vitality. And then quality of life, we have safe community. So we really have six results where we're, we're looking at and evaluating and scoring our programs against those six results. Each result has been defined. And I'm not going to go through all of them. You have them there. And if you need a larger um, copy of that, we can get that to you. But fiscal resource management, which is our governance result, is defined there. So those little bubbles around the outside defines what is it when we say fiscal resource management, what is that to us? So we can better score and align our resources. We do that with each one of these maps, economic vitality, the mobility and infrastructure. What I found very interesting is a lot of this we had kind of um, been working with already as, a, as an organization, as Kim alluded to. I, after I was sitting here listening to your meeting with the council, and listening to some of the things that were coming out of your process, so much of it aligned very nicely to what we had already there. So a lot of your ideas, the arts, the culture, the, the infrastructure, some of the mobility um, things you've been talking about really align very nicely. Now, will this change once the plan's adopted and finalized? We may be tweaking these a little bit because we want to make sure that they're always aligned with the strategic initiatives of council and the general plan. But for now, this is what we'll be using for the next budget process. It is a way of looking through a different and new lens, as I mentioned. We're no longer doing line item, bu well, we do line item budgets. I shouldn't say that, because then everybody will be running out of here saying, we're no longer doing them. <laughs> we are doing them. We have to do them. It's a legal requirement. But again, when you look at a line item, it doesn't tell you a story. It doesn't tell you if you're spending your money in the right places. Whereas when you look at a program like classification and compensation, how well does that align and how well does that support the results that we're wanting to achieve? Or um, the permitting process or the code enforcement or um, patrol, investigations, uh, fire suppression, how well are they supporting those results that we want to achieve? And when we go through this process, we look through a different lens in order to make decisions on the allocation. The programs end up in quartiles when we're done. So we've costed, we've scored, we've matched them. Not all of our programs are going to be a quartile one. What what we would consider fully supporting the results of com sense of community, safe community, quality of life. There's a math mathematical calculation based on that scoring that will place our programs in quartiles one, two, three, and four. A quartile four program would be one that isn't doing a whole lot to support the results that we want. This is where council will have an opportunity to really talk about the programs, not the line items, but the programs. And do we want to continue quartile four programs? There may be a reason that we do them. Maybe we're mandated to do them at a very, uh, you know, some level. But we'll have an opportunity with council to really talk about those quartile four, maybe quartile three programs. Maybe those programs aren't necessary. They're not meeting our needs. Do we do away with them and reallocate those to the quartile one and two programs that really are achieving our results as a city? We have not gotten to this step. We're still in the process of scoring. So this will be at the, at the conclusion of this process in January, early February. Council will get to see those quartiles and where programs fall within those quartiles and begin to have really good and me meaningful discussions around allocation of resources. This I put in here, it's just um, uh, a, a picture from the tool that we'll be using. It's a very 
simple look at the tool that uh, we'll be using to have conversations with council. It breaks the uh, programs down into quartiles. We'll know the dollar amounts of what we're spending in each of those quartiles. We can slice and dice this based on departments, divisions, revenue generating, enterprise programs, a variety of different ways. Um, but this is the city of Boulder. It's not ours because ours isn't done yet. So I had to show you something. And now we're back to this. And it, again, <coughs> our goal is to make sure that we're allocating our resources to support the initiatives of this group, the citizens, and our council. <coughs> and we do it in a way that makes sense. There's a process for doing that. This defining the quartile groupings, you said this has not been done yet. This is a sample. Right? That that was a sample because we haven't got. We're right now in the scoring phase. Okay, so we're just prioritizing which which programs are going to be top tier versus bottom tier. Right. Okay. We will have something that looks not okay. identical to that, but that's the end result. Okay. Are you comparing? You seem to be comparing to other 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 cities that might be similar prior prioritized to us to see what we fall. I'm not sure if that would be a benefit or not. No, because this is all about making sure we achieve our results and, and the direction that the council and the general plan has for us. So it's about really the city of Goodyear and making sure we're, we're putting our money where we want it. Yeah. Aren't quartals just each quarter? So shouldn't they be about equal in number? Mm -mm. Not necessarily. No, these, this will, there is a mathematical calculation, and then we'll look to see where there's kind of a, a definite um, mathematical division between the quartiles. And so it's not a perfect quarter, 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 because um, there may be a, a, you know, a mathematical break is the, the best way I can put it. Yeah, it's, it's where you want to focus your mm -hmm. efforts at. So any other kinds of technical questions? Yeah, yeah when you're uh, in the scoring phase as you are right now, uh, how do you drill down to actually score the various programs and, and who does that? Can you give us a, mm -hmm. a feel for that process, please? We have um, different levels where we've assigned. We have a zero to four scoring um, and, it, and the different definitions for that scoring. I didn't bring all of that because it, I could spend at least an hour and a half on this. But each area, so the, all of the six results are scored. Uh, all programs are scored against all six results that I, I mentioned here. We also have attributes, and those are the you know, things like, is, are we mandated to do it? Uh, are there other agencies or businesses that offer this program? So there are also um, six attributes. So in total, we're, we have 12 areas we're scoring our programs against. Um, and then departments initially score those, so that's what they're doing right now. <coughs> then we have a peer review. Up, and the leadership team will take and review those results of other directors. So it's a, a process of peer review. And then the executive team, which is uh, Brian, Bob, and myself, will have another review of this before we actually finalize this and go before council. So there's multiple levels of review. It's not super technical, but just the performance management program, the, the chart, how much, uh, what percent of the, I guess, how much weight is the citizen survey to the overall performance of the, the program, the survey at the end? The your? survey at the end tells us how well we're doing and delivering those services and, and, you know, making sure we're meeting the citizens' needs. So if we're not making sure we're putting money to what the citizens want, if we're not actually making that a priority in our strategic plan, that's our feedback loop from that's the citizens. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so that gets feed, fed back in, and then you'll be reprioritized with that information, with external, internal, and external. It's an internal also because we have the performance evaluation tool, which we just redesigned for employees too to line up with all of these um, areas. So is it like 50-50 <coughs> kind of breakdown between internal versus external, like how you how you how you're going to, I guess, judge your employees, or is it more, I was just curious what the percentage I don't think, we, we really don't have a percentage. Um, that <laughs> we, <laughs> we haven't fine-tuned it to how, that how, level. How, how weighted, I was just curious how weighted it was. 
the citizens survey is something that um, the council I know focuses on we focus on we're getting ready to um, send that out I think that'll be uh, January. January January we're sending that out uh, getting results back in um, early next year so that's important we do that every two years and, and it's a big emphasis and then we evaluate our employees internally mm -hmm. I would just add to that as far as the citizen survey, um, not only as Wynette said, we'll have that so as we go into the budget process we can hear, you know, from the citizens how well are we performing on those core services, but also are there specific areas we need to address or prioritize as far as new programs. Uh, so as Wynette said, as we look at quartile four, maybe there's some new ideas that the citizens want that align more more um, closely with our results, uh, but that also that the citizen survey results are also uh, actively used when we look at department plans, the city strategic action plan to see uh, what are those things that our citizens are saying are most important um, to them as far as improving their quality of life. So it's kind of an iterative process. And check and adjust as you go because I mean right. their priorities are going to shift as you move yes. along through the mm -hmm. life cycle of our city. So. Mm -hmm. One more. Go ahead. You got it. I'll just let you touch for new programs, is it, how does the assessment for new programs work? In other words, um, is there a, a time period where they're allowed to be in place before they roll into the evaluation cycle? They actually have to go through this process before they are considered in the budget process. So if it's a quartile three or four it comes out as that, eh, probably not going to have a real high priority in the budget. I could, yeah. yeah. So they actually have to go through this process and we're designing that right now uh, uh, as to how that looks and feels and smells and tastes and all of that but well they'll run through the the priority based budgeting scoring and costing it out I think it's smart to have the prioritized budget this way. I mean, so you can, so you're not just going over the place. You're you're structured, so prioritize, prioritize the things like words. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think yeah, it's working, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Well, I first I'd like to thank uh, Katie and, and you for having us uh, because I think it's, uh, I was frankly surprised when uh, you, the interest of the committee was to hear the, the inner workings or the details. But then I thought about it and I thought, well, if you're making recommendations, it really would be nice when you're making those recommendations to see the process to, to in the implementation of those in, within the, the governmental structure. So I think it makes perfect sense and I really applaud you for, you know, looking at it because I think it will help you in, in terms of uh, completing your final report. Uh, my, I'm going to go through fairly quickly the uh, capital improvement plan overview and also the infrastructure improvement plan overview also. They're really related. They're really one of the same, but they're a little different. I'll, I'll try to distinguish that in the latter part of my, uh, my comments. The purpose of our capital improvement plan is uh, we have changed it from a five-year program to a 10-year program. 
capital improvement pro projects are one-time projects. Uh, they're not maintenance related. They're over $50,000 in value, and they have to have a use useful life, life uh, oh, in excess of uh, five years. You don't want a routine maintenance fun function for on an operating basis to be included as a as a CIP project. These are usually one-time purchases, and they're significant in nature. Could be uh, millions of dollars uh, for for the project. The longer-term project that we're uh, employing is more important because it will link, as as I'll uh, explain later, to the uh, infrastructure improvement program. The new fee legislation. Uh, that uh, Mark mentioned earlier requires specific funding uh, and, and, and it really constrains the city as far as the example was a park site. You can't build, uh, you, you have a limit on the number, the, the size of the acreage of the park site you can build. So they want to have it uh, set up so that uh, they're relevant to the city's core services as, as was mentioned earlier. And also the projects that uh, are needed for the in, in the IIP have to be built within a 10-year period, 15 if it's a wastewater or water infrastructure. <coughs> the other other uh, benefit is the planning purpose. The planning purpose uh, for the council and the city staff, the longer time horizon, 10 years, will allow. Uh, better decisions to be made. You're not just looking at the first next year or three years or five years. You really have a, 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 a long-term uh, period that you're looking at. And if you have to bond for projects, it really helps you establish your financial uh, positioning for to support these projects. Our capital improvement uh, plan uh, goes through a number of steps. We are already we, we went through the first step, which is the top one on the, the line uh, on the slide there. It's where we first introduced with, uh, to our to a council at, at our retreat. As far as what the program will be in terms of just the general nature of it and the process, we, we at the retreat, we also asked the council if they wanted to make some minor changes in the, the process that we use, and we, we got some uh, valuable field feedback from a council that we're incorporating. The next step in November is uh, when we start to begin to look at our finance department. We'll look at financial pro projections, uh, what the revenue picture looks like, uh, and also begin to look at assembling the project requests from the various departments. We have an internal CIP committee that uh, will begin the process of setting priorities. And I'll show you how we, we do evaluate those priorities in, in, uh, on an administrative basis. And then we come up with, uh, by the end of the year, or for actually in January and February, we will have a draft, uh, our first draft of a CIP program, a listing of all the improvements that we're planning to do. At that point, and this is one of the feedback uh, points that we got from, from council, they wanted to see our plan earlier in the process. We weren't able to get to the, to the council until late in the budget cycle uh, last year. This year, we're gonna move it up to January. That will allow council to re really see how the projects are lining up, if uh, the projects are in the priority that, uh, uh, that, that the council is uh, comfortable with or they want to make some changes or even, even add a project or delete a project. So it gives us a, a first uh, a early uh, exchange of their ideas. And then we'll go through the, the rest of the steps uh, internally from an administrative basis until we, we complete the CIP as prepared by the city manager, adopt it uh, to our recommendation to council, and then they will go through the formal adoption process. The parties that will uh, <coughs> participate in this and the in internal staff would be, it's, it's primarily, primarily led by the finance department, but also engineering uh, is, is a significant contributor because they are uh, planning and, and and helping to facilitate a lot of the projects in terms of preliminary uh, concept plans and working with the outside consultants. Our water and wastewater section, a large part of the infrastructure plan involves uh, sewer plants, water, uh, water resource facilities. Uh, facilities, uh, buildings, new construction of new facilities, fire, uh, fire police, uh, fire stations, uh, police, 
are also involved in those discussions, and Parks and Recreation. The, one of the uh, primary sources of revenue for the CIP program is the construction sales tax uh, revenue. This is a chart over the last, actually s since uh, fiscal year 2004 to the current, and you can see the uh, spike that I think it, I think you'll see that it generally uh, tracks with uh, the the recession and the economy over the past in, in this period. It went from a high of uh, 22 million down to a low of uh, 3.5 million. This revenue source represents about 50 percent uh, of the. Uh, uh, fifty percent of this number, the numbers that you see in this chart, are referred to as one-time monies, and they will they will go towards supporting the the uh, many of the projects in the CIP program. Also, from a historical perspective, this gives you kind of the trends as far as if you look at both the, the CIP funding from the construction. Uh, from the general fund, the construction sales tax, or other sources. And the other sources can be uh, grants or bonds or development fees. And you'll see, actually from, I'll, I'll go back to two, 2010, uh, but from 2011 to 2014, it goes from 20 million down to uh, 1.7 million in 13 last year. And this year we're at uh, a total of, um, a total of 12.3 million. And as you can see there in, in, two, in 2014, uh, 6 million is general fund and the other sources, 6.3 million are from the other, other areas. Now the large spike in 2010 uh, results from, uh, it was anticipated uh, a $40 million uh, in, in general obligation bonds, a bonding source that the city can uh, utilize for the city center, proposed city center were not sold due to the economic decline and the project was put on hold. So the budget reflected this, but it wasn't really spent or it wasn't really incurred. So that's why the, the large spike there. That project was uh, put on hold and is uh, still on, in that, that, that status. I mentioned earlier the uh, CIP criteria and the weighting process that, that's used. I won't go into detail, but you'll see on this chart uh, there's a number of categories. The most significant one is con uh, contractual obligations. And contractual obligations mean where there, it, there's an opportunity for the city to leverage uh, their money with loan with grants that are available. But one of the uh, areas that we are able to, to uh, utilize is uh, Maricopa Association Government's uh, MAG uh, CMAC funds, which is air quality funds. Air quality funds can be used for uh, resurfacing projects, paving projects, dust control projects. So if there's a road that we want to pave, uh, the, the community is, is obligated to pay generally about 20 percent, 10 to 20 percent, and the other 80 to 90 percent is it comes from a federal grant. So those projects allow us to leverage our construction monies, our, our general fund monies, and able us, enable us to do far more work than it would be if we just confined it to, to local funds. We also look at the, the public council support. These projects are <clears throat> initiated by the operating departments. The, like if it's a streets project, it would be from engineering. If it's a water wastewater, it would be from the uh, 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 environmental services department. Or if it was a parks project, it would be initiated through the, the uh, the stakeholder department. But they basically start the process. Then these other factors will come into play and we'll come up with a, a rating score and they will all be rated. All the, prior, all the CIP projects will be rated and then the ones that have the highest ranked score will be put in the original, original listing for, as I mentioned earlier, council to, to review it and see if they concur with that, that, uh, that priority order. I'll move to the IIP process. This, uh, this, this slide is just to kind of give you uh, what I, my opinion in, in, as far as what, what the IIP process is intended to do. This has been, uh, it's been 
dr driven recently with uh, the current re legislation. And you first have to develop your land use. What is the land use pattern um, uh, of the current city? The, the zoning, the, what, what can be built within the, the, uh, the, uh, the planning area of the city? Then you look at uh, growth projections. So you, you base your growth projections both on residential uh, and population increases as well as industrial commercial uh, increases that you anticipate. And then you add into that those, those two other areas, what infrastructure is necessary to build to support the uh, growth and also the, the current land use projections. Now, when you complete that effort through a, to, through a, through a study, it yields two results. The first result is what the, phys what the list of projects that will be necessary, what infrastructure projects will be necessary to address the growth projections. And also, when you look at what facilities are gonna be built within that period, how do you spread those costs onto the, 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 the people who are benefiting from that? And the people that are benefiting are the people that are moving into the, the, uh, the homes or the people that are establishing businesses or commercial properties. So what you yield is, is a rate uh, per household that when a household is built, a developer uh, will have, or the, the purchaser of the, the home will pay a certain amount. It's, uh, it's approximately $12,000 per home right now and our study at this point in time recommends that it goes up, go up in, in approximately, uh, I think it's four to $6,000 more than what it is currently. That number is a high number and we're probably going through the process to reduce that as, as time goes on. There's a very dedicated schedule that we'll be going through in the next three months to reach that. This is, this is how that schedule will lay, lay out. <clears throat> we have a public hearing that's been uh, suggested or has been uh, uh, established by council on October 28th and that will be coming up in uh, January 13th. That's the opportunity for the, for the business community, uh, any interested citizen, to come in and weigh in on what the land use plan is, um, what, what the projections are stated in there, and also the IMP and IIP uh, infrastructure uh, improvement pr plan in general, uh, they can make comments on both. There's another month that will go by on February 24th. Um, there'll be another meeting and it will, the council will adopt the, uh, uh, the second public hearing and then that public hearing will be held on March 31st. These dates are expli explicitly stated, not the dates, but the time between the, these dates is explicitly stated in the legislation. It's they, the legislature intentionally wanted a long period of time for which the business community or any interested party could weigh in and, and voice their uh, objections if they had any. And then finally, uh, once the fees are, uh, the public hearings are completed, it will go back to council, and this is really their first opportunity to weigh in on it. Uh, on March 12th, they, they will uh, consider those fees, either adopt, make changes, and then adopt those fees to become effective in July of uh, 26. A look at how we've broken up the city is on the next page. The, the nature of Goodyear, as you're all familiar, is a long, very long, uh, and, and uh, it was tough to really look at how, it, it, there, there is a different cost to provide facilities, and we tried to look at how those areas would break up. So there was actually five different areas that were established for Goodyear, but the, the lower two, the, 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 the bottom section and the middle section are not going to be, uh, there's no fees charged there because we really don't anticipate any significant growth to occur in those areas over the next 10 years. So remember the 10 year period is what we're looking at, 10 year time horizon. But the areas that we, we do anticipate uh, significant construction would, would be the what we're referring to the north, which would be ev everything north of I-10. The central area would be the I-10 to the Gila River. And then the, uh, the, the, the south area 
would be the uh, the the river to the Picos, uh, Gila River to the Picos uh, at, uh, Road. Each one of those areas for some of the facilities, such as uh, streets, uh, there's each each uh, each of the utilities or the pavements would have a little different way in which they're spreading the costs to those very respective areas. A fire station is treated at large, so everyone will pay the same res with respect to the cost of a fire station in the impact fee uh, <clears throat> with all three. But there may be some differences, for example, in the streets, a component of the impact fee. The land use uh, assumptions that were used, this is just a quick snapshot. I, I just would want to bring your attention to the, the uh, upper uh, right-hand section. What they, they have looked at, the yellow shaded shows the, uh, the actual number of permits from 2008 to 2012, and the, both in the housing units and also the non-residential units. Then from that, we project uh, how many residential units will occur over the next, uh, f um, actually the next uh, five years or not next, yeah, the next six years that are shown here. And you'll see modest growth rates uh, for each, each category. And this is what uh, I referred to as a, the land use assumptions and the growth projections. This is how it would equate out. So the impact fee study is a very detailed uh, document that will if anyone has a question, how did you come up with this amount of uh, infrastructure need? It's, it, it can all be tracked back based on what the zoning is and also what the land use projections are and what the cost of the infrastructure is to support that. To carry through the, uh, the theme and also the objectives of the strategic action plan, the parks, or the, the various improvements, I, I just highlighted a number of them here. Uh, the, based on the analysis that came out, there were two additional community parks that were uh, projected that to be built within this next 10-year uh, period. We probably are going to refine that to one park, uh, but that gives you an, a, a, an idea of what the, the, the uh, analysis will, will generate. The other significant issues would be the surface water acquisition, where we're totally relying on groundwater at this point in time. We want to begin to use uh, Colorado uh, River water uh, that's available to us, uh, and and to, in order to to uh, to bring that water to the city distribution system, there'll be a significant infrastructure investment, and that that that's one of the area, major areas that are included in the water resource component. Sewer lines, uh, West Goodyear developments, they're, they're going to be working in uh, putting in uh, uh, large sewer mains and water mains where there, there are regional benefits that can be shown. They will be uh, included in that, that impact fee study too, and that's, that's one of the uh, collection system uh, inc inc increases. Uh, sewer, the sewer plant, the water reclamation facility will be expanded. Uh, and as well as some street improvements that are also included in this study. That's a quick snapshot of some of the highlights that were uh, included in this year's program draft, and it will be a draft until the council approves a final document in, in uh, July or June. Finally, I think this, is, uh, this is, was shared with council that uh, as we look at the five, the, our current five years, we wanted to show how they lined up with the major initiatives in the strategic action plan. And you can't really see that this, that well, but uh, in terms of the four main categories, the projects that we have already had in, on the books, even now as we pull, pull out the, and how do they match up against our strategic focus area, all of them line up with one uh, uh, initiative or another. And I think it, it just, it shows you that uh, there, th this is this process starting from the, the information Kim uh, gave you and to Wynette and through the CIP project, it's very intentional, it's purposed, and it's strategic. It's really trying to get the, the, the 
the information that we hear from the general plan documents and the master plan work that we've done in the city and bring that all the way through to, to the cost of uh, in, uh, to install major infrastructure and, and the large capital uh, improvements necessary in the city. So with that, my talk is done. Thank you. So thank you. So first of all, the next time anybody says to you, why are they doing this? <laughs> um, came through a strategic plan process, it was prioritized, and then programmed. Um, but I think that what we sort of want to try to do with this discussion is we've developed um, the general plan goals. You, most of you have been through them. Um, just one to ask any questions about important priorities for the city, and then begin to think about generically, not specific line by line, what are the kinds of things that we want to emphasize in the plan? And so it doesn't mean you have to read through each goal, but you know, I'm sure you know you like me, you have things that are kind of floating around in your brain that you remember being in the plan or general concepts that are important. I think we want to begin to give some feedback to Katie about that. Or the other thing that we could also um, comment on is key items in this process that you know we feel we might want to use as we identify priorities. I heard, for example, um, maybe it is looking at our goals and comparing them to some of these strategic um, alignments. Maybe it's using some of the factors that, you know, Bob uses when they develop the CIP plan. How well does that line up with these key things? Are these things that we are obligated to do? Um, you know, beginning to just maybe group things into short, medium, and long term, or high and medium and low priority, which is sort of what this uh, priority-based budgeting does. So. Again, just beginning to talk about an approach we might want to take towards prioritizing um, ideas in the general plan. One of the things we might want to compare to is the vision, which Katie was going to throw up. Um, we have goals to compare to. So with that, I'm just going to sort of stop talking and, and one, start with, are there just any questions for the team? Before you start, I just want to say thank you, because it's great. And this makes you, I remember, oh my gosh, it's like brain dead. So thank you. It's a lot of things. Um, any questions? <laughs> Overload. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Did, did we already approve that fleet facility? I was looking at one of the lines. I know it's almost too specific yes. or not. Yes. Mm -hmm. Get it specific. This is the time. I thought we Get did. It. Yeah. It's going to council, on, matter of fact, next week for a council uh, contract award. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did they look at grabbing some of the other, s other cities around the area to see if we could also contract out and use some of their, maybe contract some of their large, to, to use that facility to the max once we start building it out? try to like maybe contract out to Avondale and start doing maintenance on their pieces of equipment. Since we're gonna build this huge area that we could maybe try to take some of the maintenance from other places as well and try to utilize it as much as possible. To be, to to be honest, uh, I don't think that has <coughs> been looked at. Uh, this, is, this is one of the unintended consequences of the uh, legislation. One of the facts of the legislation was that if you have collected any public works impact fees pr prior to the enacted uh, date of that legislation, you have up until I think two years to spend that money or you have to replace that money uh, or you have to refund that money to the, the people who, who had uh, paid those impact fees. So the cities had to look at, okay, there's public work impact fees, we need a fuel station or need a, a fleet uh, facility and there's, we're pressed for, we need more space, not just for that, but that building that's there today has to be used by PD for evidence storage area. So it's, it's kind of a musical chair uh, situation. So it was more like we need some space quickly and we, we, need, we have a funding source, we need to really build that now. It, timing was good. Yeah. So in the future, that's, we have two options. We could expand or we can, we can determine through the uh, priority-based budgeting what things we do well, this is how it will be used, this is a good example. What will we do well from the fleet maintenance standpoint? Do those services and look for outside contracted sources to do the other work that we may not be as efficient in. Sure. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely in the plan and that's what we're thinking about. Yeah, yeah just to utilize it as much as possible. Right. Well, I just 
you had mentioned briefly that the 70 million that was put aside for the city center was that money used uh, to maintain city in the downtimes, or has it been put away? Or, or is there a city center planned in the near future? Because uh, that's one thing that was mentioned very strongly here. I wasn't here, but I'll give you an answer, and, and Kim will uh, change. Uh, will correct me if I uh, misspeak. I, the uh, my understanding is that it, the authorization to bond for that was given by council, but it was never followed through with, so the money was never received. Yeah, that's correct. And we still actually have uh, voter approved authority to sell those bonds, the general obligation bonds. Um, but when we were, uh, you know, budgeting for that, as you saw on the slide, uh, what happened is as we were finishing up the design, we were doing a financial analysis um, because the way that we pay back our annual debt service on those bonds is through our secondary property tax revenue. And so right at the time that we were finishing the design and getting ready to move to construction, the downturn started happening our, and our assessed valuation, which drives our, our property tax revenue, uh, went significantly down. And so in May 2010, we officially postponed it. Uh, as Bob said, those bonds were never sold, so there was never any money brought into the city. Um, right now, uh, our latest analysis is that our assessed valuation is going up slowly but surely, but it's a positive outlook. Uh, but we probably will not have sufficient revenues to pay the annual debt service on those bonds until about 2019. So it's still on hold for the foreseeable future. And I would say uh, through this process, um, we may look at other um, uh, uses for general obligation bond proceeds. So um, there's no set time frame right now for, for a city hall facility. Sorry, one more. Um, I noticed on the construction sales tax revenues, you, you budgeted less for next year than this year's. Are you just kind of taking the conservative approach to it or because uh, I, I, I see that there's a trend going up. Um, are you purposely budgeting low? Um, no, our, our finance finance department is, is looking at all the sales tax receipts for, that have come in, but they're also looking at uh, what drove up last year's increase and that was really the uh, 303 construction. A big part of that was front end loaded and a lot of the expend expenditures and sales tax revenues came in for, for that. They still seem positive increases, but there there doesn't appear to be the, the major infrastructure project such as the 303 on the immediate horizon. Any other questions? All right, so then what I'd like to do is I think I'm gonna give you all this <laughs> but I think what we're going to try to do now is, with all this great brain dump that we just got tonight, begin to think about what are some of the things that we want to use when we begin to look at the general plan and then the implementation part of it to talk about what our plan priorities are. Um, and I think Katie's got a slide up here. If I'm not mistaken, Katie's going to have a whole system figured out, yeah? No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just brought up that slide that Kim had talked about that we showed at the joint work session. If you wanted to, just to reiterate what they were saying, that um, it's kind of been awesome how um, we've had two separate processes with the strategic action plan and the general plan, but we all kind of came to the same conclusion. It just validates. So this is just the general plan strategies versus the strategic action plan. And you can see several of them are right on, and there was just a few that weren't highlighted in the vision statement, but they're they're in the plan. And actually, I'd like to think that the connectivity mobility element is getting highlighted in the strategic action plan now because of all the outreach we've done and been hearing that over and over. So I'll just take credit for that. <laughs>
ways do you think we should think about <coughs> for, you know, us to move forward with these ideas? Or not? Yeah, do you have different elements of the plan? Or you're saying I'm just saying across the board, when you read something, what, how do we want to begin to filter this in terms of what's really important, what's short term, maybe what we recognize as a little longer term? Are there things that we want to um, emphasize um, consideration of as these things get moved forward? Because, you know, these are going to go into a strategic plan. You saw how they're going to get weighed against community surveys. Um, are they required and mandated? Uh, what kinds of returns do they have? What's the funding? How closely do they align with strategic goals? So when someone do wants to do something, one of the documents they're going to reach for is the general plan, and they're going to say, oh, it's in the general plan. But they could also say, oh, it's a high priority in the general plan. It's a short-term priority in the general plan. It's in the general plan, but it's sort of on the general plan. I don't want to use the word wish list, but, you know, we could do in the future list. Um, so, you know, what kinds of things should we be thinking about, or how should we begin to evaluate some of that stuff? And I know it's like a, a big question, so. You're talking about things like economic vitality? Yeah, I mean, so I some of the things that we're recommending doing, some like. Um, some, some of the things up there, the, like the things up there on that board? <laughs> yeah. I mean, do we want to sort of align the goals to the four focus areas then, rather than the three current groups that we have? Okay, so that might be one idea. Do we want to begin to look at maybe uh, aligning our goals in the plan to those four focus areas? That could be something we could do. Maybe put a symbol next to each one of the goals to show what focus area it supports. Just to, just to get things started, I think looking at economic opportunity <coughs> and just knowing that as far as a priority list, we want to be, be able to have the funds and have the money as a city to create jobs in order for us to thrive anyway. So from, from a, I think it, you know the economic vitality is probably our first, at least in my eyes, one of the, the biggest priorities. So maybe as we move through these bills, we need to think about we really want to do things or put things out front that contribute to uh, the city's revenue. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me challenge you a little bit on that. What about um, policies like affording, uh, providing housing choice? So what will we do with things like that really don't have an economic, you know, or, uh, I don't want to say a measurable, but a quantifiable and easily quantifiable, providing walkable communities, how would that there in that kind of a metric. So if we use that kind of a metric um, to look at, how would we interpret some of those things? I think you can look at that as a matter of what we talked about, construction sales tax revenue. So as, are these homes, is construction going to thrive by bringing these types of homes okay. in? So and as building permits increase, the, the quality of our home is going to increase that type of community. Any, anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, don't, we, that? don't we lose money for every house? They bring in so we want to focus more on businesses, right? For economic vitality and tax bases. You know, Carrie might throw a knife in the back like this, but I think that's a, when people say that's a double edged sword. You need the house to buy the stuff. We do, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying it's a balance. <laughs> but sort of like for service, for straight services, I think it depends on the business as well. Sure, go ahead. All right, Brandon, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> we just look at it for services. Yeah, yeah but the house is what um, buys. So what Brandon was referring to. Is that just five based on times the amount uh, that you would see in your fair. quarter size plan? Is that also based on sort of the price of the house, the valuation, rather than the percentage tax base? Then? No, the exact same home will pay four to five times a higher tax bill, and so um, and and that's a public policy decision, right? Mm -hmm. To sort of redistribute the burden of taxation for infrastructure. 
infrastructure and amenities and schools and so forth. Um, <coughs> said, what Leslie is saying is um, what are municipalities here for? Why do we have sense of community and economic vitality and you know quality schools and all, all of that is what creates the sense of community. So Tony's point about um, would you want diverse data housing is about community. That creates a more interesting quality of community, some would say. And so just to say that we want all you know one acre lots with street widows, you know, something really simple. So if we were to say that we wanted all um, major arterials in our city, so that being, uh, let's say, like an Estray and Parkway that you would have right next to, with a major boulevard and, you know, three, four lanes and deceleration lanes, or you, would you say that you may, what, may want more of a Main Street kind of concept? You know, one lane with um, parallel parking and, you know, major streetscape and trees and so forth. Do we want a diversity of street types in our community so that we have options for our residents? And so I think it's important to think about some of the, the softer things that aren't job related or tax related as um, I, I think of them in my industry as, as infrastructure, right? So parks are infrastructure for growth potentially. They create that amenity, that attraction that makes a community successful. The same with um, arts and culture. So one of the ways to think about this too that a lot of times is used is the job housing balance. And I think Goodyear is, Katie just said it, 0. 0.7 to 1, which means there's 0. 0.7 jobs for every single person that lives in Goodyear. And if you think about that, Isn't it is that true? Person? Say that again? Isn't it household? No, it's usually persons. It's persons. So uh, what that means in, in a funny way, 0. 0.7 to 1 is, Every person there's kids in Goodyear. So not enough jobs. So there's not every single per, you know person is let's say working person is employed so to speak. Um, that means there might be single family households things like that. But if you're above one, that means you import jobs. So maybe one way to look at economic development is does it help us create jobs or import jobs or bring jobs into the community, as opposed to does it bring a revenue into the community. So maybe that could be one thing we look mm -hmm. at. What would be another thing? I like to step back. So when we're talking about how they value programs, they hold goals. So if we execute to do this development and get our plan, regulators have goals. So if we're going to build a plan in the next 10 years, what is the output we expect from what we value about our community opportunity? And then how would we value that? It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's super. Okay. Thank you. Okay, here's an idea that we just had. Um, this idea of outputs and measurements is, is a great idea because every year the city needs to go back, Katie's going to end up, or whoever Katie becomes, 
um, is going to go back and report on the general plan. You're required by law to do this. And so what we were thinking is that maybe in February, when we're kind of through the plan and it's going out for a 60-day review, we could just spend an hour going through some of the major goals and talking about what are some of those measurable outputs we'd like to see. And those could be the metrics against which the annual reporting is provided. So how does that sound for an approach to kind of look at evaluating and moving forward? And that also will allow you to go home sooner. So you want to look at our look at the look at the results that we want first and try to measure them. Like we want 50 50 percent more jobs. What does provide housing diversity mean? Yeah. Or we want a mix of so this many this and that yeah. for yeah. square footage. Or yeah, this and it might not have to be power. that detailed so either. So specific and measurable, basically. Yeah. Smart, um, smart subjectively goals. and objectively measurable. Outcomes, yeah. kinds of outcomes that we're looking for. So maybe do some of our own outcome-based planning for the goals in the general plan. How does that sound as an idea to folks? And the challenge is, just, just as you heard tonight, city council has to do this on a year or 10-year basis. So your federal one, right, has to have that same sort of horizon. So not everything can be next year or in the third year of the plan. It might be five to 10 years as a prioritization. So thank you. Well, Brandon, thank you for giving us the answer. I really mm -hmm. need it. So, um, okay, so if that works with everyone, then I think we can kind of close this, this uh, portion of the meeting. But begin to think about, as you read through the plan, you know, maybe just want to begin to jot down the margin. What the heck does this really mean to me? You know, as a citizen of Goodyear, what do I really care about with regard to this goal? Those will become our, our performance measures mm -hmm. for when Katie goes back to the council next year. And basically, too, how... How are you going to make sure that we're doing what the plan says? How are you going to measure our performance in implementing the plan? You know, how are you? Or even if a, a resident who wasn't having the privilege mm -hmm. of being part of the committee, if they picked it up, what would they think your intent was? Mm -hmm. I like this idea. This is it. Okay. No, well, I good. think it'll work great. Okay, so. Uh, Next. Gonna, oh, yeah, back. Mark. Sorry. I have a larger question. I'm looking at the chapter headings of our plan. Yes. We've seen one through four. You've distributed to us and we've given it. Mm -hmm. And not to denigrate any of the work that's been done there, but chapter one about Goodyear, chapter two, the profile, that's drawing upon stuff we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Land use is stuff we talked about a lot. We have chapters five, six, seven, and eight to go. And to my belief, there's many of these goals in those chapters that we have not even discussed. And I'm kind of at a loss <laughs> how in two months we're going to come up with mm -hmm. a final document. And Thank you. That's a great question. You have received all the goals. The goals are in the vision chapter. Yes. So you, everyone has received every single goal. So I'm hoping everyone's reviewed the goals and make sure that you like the goals. And you're right, you've received the land use, um, land use and transportation plan, which is a huge chunk of the general plan, and you received the community and culture. You have not received physical growth and development or the economic development. And I apologize, I wish I could have gotten it to you, I just have not, I'm not gonna make excuses. You haven't seen it, you're right. But you know, to answer your question, we have, we kind of realized that mm -hmm. it is sort of, with every project, it's the push. And right now we're in the push. And in January, what we've done is set five nights aside where Katie and I are going to be here, and we're just going to have tables set up, and each table is going to be focused on a topic, and we are here to fix and listen. And so instead of everybody redlining the plan, oh, should we have said and as opposed to also, what we really want to do is sit around and come. And so each of the is each night on a topic? Did we do a topic for each night? Yes. So each night is a topic. So if you care about all five topics, come all five nights. If you're only caring about two topics, come two mm -hmm. nights. If you think all the topics are good, you get five nights off. So um, think that through. And then also, that stuff is out there. If you have questions or ideas or we need more refinement, that's why you have those goals now. Or what's going to be in this goal? Or are you going to be talking about X, Y, Z under this goal? That's stuff that um, I would encourage you strongly to email to Katie mm -hmm. now, because um, that she she's been pretty religious about dumping stuff in. So um, I don't think anything any 
anyone's really said has been taken out. Um, so um, I, I would just really strongly encourage you to, 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 to do that kind of uh, editorial questioning. And then also know that in January, and we can give you, do we have those? We have those dates. I don't know them offhand. Yeah. But we can send them out to you so you can plan for them. Yeah, and those. Those dates are on that calendar I handed out. And we I did have the sign-in sheet last time, and I have them now. Um, they have to get revised because you might have noticed the environmental sustainability. It got put into the other chapters. We decided open space fit better with parks. Water wanted their chapters to be together, and then we were only left with like two goals. So we decided to just kind of get, it, it's not that environment's not important, it just got redistributed into other portions of the plan so the people who signed up for that chapter I need you to sign up for a different one so I have those here so if you haven't had a chance to sign up for a date um, and I'll send it in a follow-up email with that but you're going to be getting the entire plan at your at the December meeting the entire plan in a very finished what do you think about this going out to the community kind of format and so then that's then the January meetings as Leslie said will be looking and then after our meetings in January we'll be sending it out for a required 60-day review by the community so that'll be another shot for us to be looking at it while the community is looking at it too and then that ends in um, March before your final March meeting it's a lot it's a lot to get done Okay. I actually, I, I'm curious, Mark. What, what's your concern with, every, with the issue? Because I, I, I'm kind of with Mark a little bit. I feel like there's, I don't know. To me, I feel like tonight was nice, but there's a lot of stuff coming in. We're just being bombarded by information, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the meeting, it's like, let's get out of here and go. We haven't really said anything. I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. stuff going on that we want to bring up. A lot of points that people have about the meetings or not in the meetings that we have about what we want the city to be going and okay. doing towards the general plan to me I know we've been mm -hmm. at the beginning of the meetings we were very specific this is a general plan I know we need to be more general and broad with our no, conversations <laughs> and I know we haven't done that all the time but I think with this stuff it's great but we're the general plan from what I've been told and led to believe about this is that the general plan is kind of like the all-seeing kind of encompassing thing mm -hmm. that the city council kind of follows whenever they make plans it's not like the minute detailed information that they need but it's the this is what 25 people who are representing the city want kind of done with this city we're the voice for the other 80,000 plus people that live here and we haven't really said a whole lot that I don't know if that's what marks that but that's kind of where I'm at well I'm glad you're bringing up this now while we have time but I guess I would throw it back at you and say why haven't you brought it up? I mean, we've had idea champions. I mean, we do. I mean, I feel like everyone kind of gets dead at the end of the meetings. And I'm feeling like, well, let me, let me I just, don't know. Let me just <laughs> maybe shift this a little bit more. I hear what you're saying is that there's a lot more stuff to talk about. Mm -hmm. It is a meaty document. Um, we got a lot of input in the beginning and mm -hmm. a lot of that's dumping into the plan. But what you're sort of missing now, and I, I get that, is the time to chew on it. And I think that's what I'm hearing, if I'm not mistaken. I think there's a couple things we can look at doing, and I'd like to discuss it with Chuck, but you know, one of the things we can do is we can increase the number of meetings. Um, so we could have a mid-month meeting where folks that wanted to look through this and chew on it can come, and we can just sit around a table and do that and kind of walk through the plan. And I, you know, that is something I think that we could do. Um, we could um, set something up via email where we have a blog or a discussion and people can just begin to talk about the stuff online. Um, you know, we can post it and do it that way. I know we've got open meeting law issues, but I think there's ways that we could do it. Um, so that could be another answer. We could form subcommittees of folks that want to do the plan in more detail, and then those folks could bring back their issues to a main committee meeting, and we could talk about it that way. So I think there's, there's some options. Um, let me ask, just by a show of hands, how many people feel like they need some more time to chew on this thing than we've kind of got planned? And don't be afraid. I, I really want to know. So there's about four of you or five of you. What if we put you in a subcommittee? Seriously. And say.
sat down with you and then you reported back at each meeting sort of about some things you want to guidance on. You know, this, these are where we thought, this is what we're thinking. Here are some big ideas here. We think we need to talk about them more. Because there's lots of little ideas that I don't know that really merit full conversation, but I think they're big ideas that you might want to talk about more. It's an, it's an ask. What are you thinking about that? Because that way, I'm, I'm not watching everybody want to, it's a lot of time. You know what, just as, as I, you know, I agree with him, is that, you know, there's so much information here. I think maybe a mid, mid-month meeting would be good because, I mean, our, my book has grown so much. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, now where am I? You know, where am I? Am I at land use? And, and I just, uh, for me, it would be great if we could have like a mid-month meeting and say, okay, uh, let's take the chapters out and this is where we are. This is what we've done with this and, and does that look, does that So how about, good? what if we did a mid-month meeting where we kind of sat down, reviewed a couple of chapters informally, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it might be long, it might be short, we'll have an open agenda, we'll just say review chapters, discuss key chapter ideas. It's incumbent upon those who come to read the chapters. Right. Okay, and it's where we respond to you as staff. So Katie can kind of say, here was my thought process. Here's mm -hmm. where I got these ideas from. I pulled from this document. I'm not too worried about this because it's in this master plan. But it gave everybody that extra set of time. And it'll be an informal agenda. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we could sit in that other room, just kind of sit around the table casually and just chat about it. But isn't that the point of the January meeting? That is the point of the 5 January meeting. I'm asking, you know, what my goal is, is to do what you want to do to make you feel like you've had time mm -hmm. to review the plan. Well, I think the wonderful thing is, you know, this is the format you want to discuss very beginning. You know, that very long, brainstorming session of sticky notes and, you know, no one's pulled out based on what you just said, but there's too much to cover in the amount of time you need. You know, so a casual, broader discussion is not going to make five minutes plan, and then you need to plan. You know, so. I understand that we don't have a lot of time to chew on it or whatever, but at the same time, I think we probably are going to come up with this approach months ago, you know, very long time ago. Now, if we're going to do January 5, January 6 plan for our subcommittee um, meeting, you know, those are all things we can do, but I guess we've kind of tried to see if we can kind of get and talk about this approach. You know. Here's one more idea. We send the plan out for what's called 60-day review in after the January meeting, right? Mm -hmm. After the January meeting. So we will have gone through the five meetings, <clears throat> and then the plan goes out for even more comment. It's called 60-day review. That means that that's another time where we can sit down and think through the plan. How about after we get through the five January meetings, if people feel that we still need to talk more about stuff, because you can make as many changes as you want during that 60-day review period. It's, you know, it's just here's our plan, here's our draft plan, what do you think? So how about if we use that, that February, from January to February, if we feel like we need more discussion time, we can kind of quickly figure out a way to focus on these things. Because, you know, I don't know, we, it's, it's just a question of the time and how you want to do it. And I'm, I'm struggling on how you want to have that dialogue. So we can, and I know we're having a dialogue about stuff we haven't seen. And you may read through those two chapters and think, wow, she really got it. She heard everything we said. And then you may read through them and say, oh my gosh, she was obviously on the wrong train. So, you know, th it could happen either way. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want to predispose us, but we sort of need to have something in the back of our minds so people that feel like they haven't had enough time have the comfort level to know they will have enough time. And people feel that they're comfortable with the process can say, okay, we're going to use the process we dealt with. So trying to balance those two. I'm, I'm looking for thoughts. I, I agree. I like that. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. I can go with that idea. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I think if we do that, do the five meeting. I mean, I guess too. Like, I don't know. Part of what happened tonight too is you kind of contradicted what Katie said last time because I thought last time we were supposed to sign up only for two meetings or whatever for the January. Oh, you know Leslie, why we did that because Leslie we didn't want all thirty people can, showing yeah. up for five nights in a row. But you know, God bless you guys. If you all want to show up five nights in a row, you go. <laughs> All right. We were just trying to be know, more was, sensitive was, to you. Yeah, so yeah. I was just curious about that because that's yeah. just one of those things. Feel I was free. just thinking if someone was like, holy crap, I really want to go to at least this one, but I also want to go to these two. You come. It's like, you come. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we are here for you. Yeah. Well, and I, it's not really, it's kind of tangen tangentially uh, related to this. I, I feel like from this meeting and this 
fantastic discussion. I, it was a little esoteric for me, and I don't know what I'm supposed to take from all of it. Like, I could easily go home tonight and never think about anything that they ever said again. And so I don't know what what you guys want us to take from all of this stuff that, you know, for me, I don't have any experience with any of it. And so, you know, it, there are things that I'm obviously more interested about in the plan than others, just like we all do, but I don't know how to glean, you know, the important parts of what we were supposed to learn tonight. Can, can we talk about that? Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one essential thing we're supposed to have tonight, which was the information you give us and the priorities that you give us go back into the city council and go back into the staff in these categories that you saw tonight, so economic vitality, sustainability, whatever they might be, just as the chapters are in the general plan, they get <coughs> That's really what it is about, how budget gets assigned to those priorities and how the different voices in the process get heard. So whether it's the citizen survey or the general plan or the transportation committee or the city council strategic plan, how those voices get into the process. So that's and, and you know, to add to that, all I would say is, I remember when I first learned how to do GIS, like this is goes back to the dark ages, but when it first came out in GIS, it's this complicated mapping program. If you know about it, you do. If you don't, don't worry about it. But anyway, <laughs> I remember sitting in this class and my eyeballs were spinning in my head, literally. And the guy in the class said, it's like you're in a convertible with the top down. And this information is just going to blow across your head. And maybe in six months or eight months, something is going to click. And that's sort of what I would also say about that. It was really like being in the convertible with the top down. And it was just blowing across your head. But you know, when we come to talk about things, something might pop in and just say, oh, you know what? There's an idea. That makes sense. So that's really all. you know. This was for that might be. Um, we just had a, a election on the bonds for the schools, right? Cities don't do schools, but schools do schools, and their bond election was intended to allow them overrides to build facilities in those cases, right? So the taxing revenue is there. Can they use that money to finish their capital system, their school building? That was that question, right? So the same might come to you in a few years in 2019, as Kim shared with us, if the city has the bonding capacity to release that $60 million of bonding authority, it will come to a, a, a public consideration of should we spend that $60 million on X, Y, and Z. You might go, we had this discussion in the general plan about should it be a city center, should it be a city hall, should it be you know, a park? And so that's what it was meant to give some context to. So that's what I'm saying. And the other part is the two people who were most vocal about asking for this topic, Jose and George, aren't here tonight. <laughs> 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 we'll get them, don't worry. <laughs> there was another question, go ahead. I'd just like to make a clarification, and Katie and the group, I, I did not, I came across as critical of what Katie has done, and that was not my intent, okay? My, my intent was to say, and I know I've missed the meeting, is I'm, I'm wondering how Katie is able, is going to be able to draw in addition to her knowledge, our feelings on things, and I know I've missed meetings, but I don't recall discussing employers, workforce, technology, redevelopment, safety, a number of the topics that are here. And I'm not being critical of what's been done. I'm wondering when is the time when I, I think we're behind the curve in the agendas to date in getting all of this on the table for Katie to create. Mm -hmm. And I full well recognize that the vast bulk of what gets created is Katie's knowledge, the prior plan, and drawing into us. So it's not a 100% creation on ours. But that was my perspective, and I did not mean to be critical, and I apologize for sounding that way. Mark, I just want, want to say, don't apologize. I'm really glad you brought it up, and I think Katie is too. This is mm -hmm. the discussion that yeah. we want to have. And so, you know, the concept of safe place, thank you. But in kind of responding to your other thing, there are lots of times you have told Katie, because I know I've taken the notes, what you're thinking, 
and it wasn't in a formal way. One, we get all kinds of weird comments in these discussions. All these kinds of cards that you fill out, there, a lot of them are very tangential. That helps. The other thing is, remember the tour that we took of the city? We had about five pages of comments and notes from that. That went into things like public safety and facilities and city facilities. Wow, we, we need to do this. Or, oh, gee, you're right. Or, oh, this is a need. So some of that's there. A lot of what, in some of these more, what I call line item topics that you look at, we're pulling from existing master plans. And those master plans had public processes associated with them. So those might necessarily be the committee's view, but they were, I would say, views from other public processes that were moved forward. And your role is, which is why she indicates where she gets all these uh, statements from, your role is to say, yeah, that sounds reasonable. It came from a process, or, oh my gosh, it did come from a public process, but we've done a 180 since then. Why are we still saying this? Um, and so it may not be necessarily this committee's view, but it was, let's say, another public's view um, and another public's opinion that was more attuned to that specific process. And a really good example of that might be from the Parks and Rec stuff. A lot of the stuff that I gave Katie was through the Parks and Rec process that now is reflected in the general plan that we'd like to get your opinion on. Also, from when you talked about Parks and Rec, that went into the Parks and Rec process. So what you're saying is absolutely right. Um, but it's not like she's cooking it up on a stove, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. I like the idea of and knowing that within that 60-day review that we can still go back and make comments. Yeah. And I think that was one thing. I thought, oh, we're going to have this first hit, and then it goes out. Well, we may not feel their comment again, but the fact that we have that time in between to meet again and go through each of these plan each of these different elements, that makes me feel much more comfortable. Okay. I don't see, I mean, trusting and knowing what you're writing and what you're doing is in between, the, in behind the scenes, and the efforts that we're going to be able to do within the next couple of months. I feel comfortable with that and being okay. able to meet again in February. So is, is there a general consensus that we'll, we'll get through the five January meetings and are we meeting officially in January? No. Maybe what we'll do is, because I, I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to weigh in on this, after those five meetings, um, you'll send out a revised draft of the plan, right? Okay. We'll send out a revised draft of the plan, the 60-day review draft, and we'll give everybody, because we're going to be close to February by then, We'll give you about 10 days to look at the plan, and we'll send out an email poll. And if we want to meet again in February, if we want to repeat the five January meetings in February, we'll do that. But we'll make sure that we provide that second shot to continue to revise. And it may become obvious as we go through stuff in January. So does that work for everyone? Yeah. Officially, yes? Yes. Yeah. The first shot is going to be in the summer meeting, Katie indicated she'd have a full plan for us to take home. Yeah, you won't have time to read it at the right. December meeting. So It'll we'll be, be able home. to start chewing on this stuff before the January, before, way before January. Right. Mm -hmm. Then comes January. Then you get to chew on it some more. So there'll be plenty of time. Yeah, I, I think we'll be surprised when we first see I think because we haven't seen it all yet together, mm -hmm. I think we'll be, I think we'll see everything that we've talked about in the plan that you've already put together. We just haven't seen it broken up along the way. So mm -hmm. the final product yet. So I think we'll be Pleasantly surprised when we when we see it and yeah, then you're like so. a consultant yeah, just so, yeah. at the last minute. <laughs> and right? then and then like I say, we have a whole we have mm -hmm. like three months to right. or more, four months to look at it and and see everything. So. But I think this is a really good discussion. I really yeah. again, Mark, I want to thank you because it's something mm -hmm. we needed to talk about and I'm really glad you brought it up. So thank you for that. Um, and if it's still not working, keep speaking out, okay? Don't mm -hmm. don't ever feel that you shouldn't. So that would be great. Okay, any other comments for the good of the order? I had like a whole bunch more stuff, but I mean, <laughs> it's all right. I mean, because we had a more important conversation. So I'll put this presentation up on the web so you can check it out, but I was just going to tell you what we've been through over the last, since the last meeting. You know, we had our gain community festival. Those are from the festival. We had 240 people visit our booth. We had that joint work session October 21st. And at that, I gave a presentation where I kind of walk through how I've been putting the plan together. And you might want to look at it. It's on, good, it's on um, our website. Um, you might not know what's going on behind the scenes or how I've been using your comments, so it might be worth watching or even just flipping through the PowerPoint presentation. That's, a, that's on our website, on our council? It's on GoodyearAZ.gov. Okay. And then you go to Meetings and Agendas, and yeah. you find that October 21st. That was to the city council? It was city okay. council and commission. And yeah. again, these are some of the ideas that get put into the plan that 
again, have been populating these other elements. Mm -hmm. So while you may not have discussed them directly, that's where some of this stuff is coming from as well. Um, we had a community meeting last week and we're working on getting that video up on Goodyear Connects. It was basically a repeat of the October 21st, um, just to give the community a chance to weigh in on anything we're forgetting. Um, we went to a couple high schools last week and we had some great discussions. Um, and I just have to point out real quick, because when we went to Stray Foothills, the number one, the number three thing they want to see is more community involvement. And I was just, thought that was really awesome. Not restaurants, not, you know, any of that stuff was community involvement. So, um, the art contest is finished. We've had 12 submittals, but each person submitted three or four artworks. So we've got a ton to go through and we'll have that winner by the next meeting. This is our schedule, this is it, like 10 bullet points. So, I mean, we already had that discussion. And then um, I'm planning open house meetings so the public can review that 60 day draft too that we've been talking about. And I'll get those to you just as you can see, a couple of them haven't been set yet. I'm in process, so I'll get those meeting dates to you as soon as we have them. Um, no homework, yay. Is the city Happy Thanksgiving. Hall? Is that official? What? The city hall in Australia, is that official? It hasn't been planned, it's still, I'll, I'll get that to everyone once it's planned. Um, and then the next meeting, we're gonna do the Parks and Transportation Master Plan and I'll be distributing the draft plan. So, thank you. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>